I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to the book of Jonah. Jonah chapter 3 is what we're looking at today. And if you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that is fine. Uh, there's Bibles in the seats around you. If you are in our room in, at Sweetwater, just grab one of those. If you're at our campus in Parker, there's a table right back in the middle of the room. Just get up and, and run back there real quick. Grab a Bible and turn to page 921. 921. You'll be able to follow along with us in Jonah chapter 3. And as always, if you're at one of our campuses and you need a Bible, take one. Just, just go ahead and take one. It's our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible, ask for one. We will get you one because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, how many of you, uh, if, if it was a test, could uh, tell us what the mission of Calvary is? Let me see your hands. If you could. I'm not going to ask you to say it right now, Okay. But there's a lot of you that raise your hands. If, if you don't know it, and, and when you walked in the front doors, it's written on the wall. It's kind of important to us. See, Calvary exists to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. That, that's why we do what we do. And, uh, and I tell you that because Jonah chapter 3 is the story of amazing life change. It might be the greatest uh, life change story in all of Scripture, and there's a lot of crazy ones. You know, we, we get excited about Pentecost when 3,000 people profess Jesus in one day, and I'm just here to tell you that uh, Jonah chapter 3 kind of makes that look like, you know, child's play. So Jonah chapter 3, I just want to read this to you. Before I do, if you missed the last couple of weeks, Jonah chapter 1 God tells Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach, and Jonah goes the opposite direction. He runs from God. God, of course, pursues him, causes a, a storm at the, uh, you know, surround the ship that Jonah's in. The sailors freak out. Jonah says, it's my fault. Throw me overboard. They finally do. Suddenly, the storm it, it stops. The water's calm, and they, the sailors worship God. Uh, Jonah thinks he's dead, but a fish swallows him, so he thinks he's dead. Uh, and, uh, but he realizes he's alive, and he cries out to God to, for God to save him. The prayer of desperation, we talked about that last week, that desperate cry for grace, it, is found in chapter 2. And at the end of that prayer, where Jonah praises God before he's delivered, uh, the fish vomits Jonah onto the beach. That's so great a picture, isn't it? And that's where we pick up right now. Jonah chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. <laughs> Praise God for second chances, right? The word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth, and Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey. And he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God, and they called for a fast and put on sackcloth, and from the greatest of them to the least of them. And the word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows, God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way. God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Wow. By the way, sackcloth and ashes, uh, you might choose to do that. That's just as a way of humbling yourself and saying, look, I don't need to be clean, and I don't need to be comfortable. In fact, I'm going to be uncomfortable, and I'm going to beg God to hear me. It, it's a physical form of uh, what fasting is denying yourself. So uh, Jonah chapter 3 is an incredible story of life change. We read this, and, and, and we're like, oh, that's really cool. But think about it. An entire city repented. An entire city. Well, you know, we just were excited about revivals breaking out on a, a couple of small college campuses 
Can you imagine if Phoenix or Vegas all got saved? Yeah, see, we're like, wow, that's cool. What about if Lake Havasu and Parker got saved? Well, you know, a lot of times we think, well, oh, uh, yeah, that happened in the Bible. It can't happen now. But see, that's a picture of God's incredible, amazing grace. In Jonah's story, and this is the key thing I want you to, to hear today, reluctant obedience resulted in amazing repentance. Reluctant obedience resulted in amazing repentance. Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. That's been quite clear. Chapters one and two were all about Jonah not being obedient. And then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, and he went, all right, I'll go. I'll go. Okay. So before we talk about, you know, what we can learn from Jonah, can I just uh, ask you a question? And it's this. Do you really want to see the power of God in your life? Yes. Okay. See, see this is, this is a, a, the key question that you need to wrestle with, because here's the thing about the, the story of Jonah is we can see this kind of power of God in our life. But if you want to see the power of God, then you have to obey God. You actually have to obey him, uh, especially when you don't want to obey him. And by the way, that's most of the time. That's most of the time. We don't, we don't naturally want to obey God. We are natural born sinners which is why the, the love of God for us is an incredible, amazing thing. It, it's an incomprehensible reality that the creator who holds all power would look at us, his rebellious creation, and go, hey, you know what? I could squash them like a bug, but instead I think I'll go and suffer on a cross and save them. Why? That's, that's, that's the great question is it's grace. So, um, so it's obeying God, especially when you don't want to obey God. And by the way, that's not hypocrisy. That's not faking it. That's choosing to obey reluctantly. God doesn't need us to obey enthusiastically. It's nice, but he doesn't need that. He doesn't need us to obey, you know, like cheering on everybody around. No, he just needs us to do what he says to do. Um, it's what we're called to do. Uh, and the illustrations are, are throughout Scripture and our lives. Let me give you two illustrations to chew on. Uh, the, the first one is simply Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane is a picture of reluctant obedience. Because in the Garden of Gethsemane, if you, you, know, if you haven't read it, you should go and read it again. You should be reading it like for the third time if you read through the Bible in a year, uh, at least on the plan I'm in. And, and, and here's the thing, Jesus prayed... Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. In other words, Father, I don't want to die, especially on a cross. I mean, most of us don't even want to die of old age until you get to be really old, and then you're like, why am I still here? <laughs> right? But, but Jesus didn't want to die. He didn't want to suffer that way. He said, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, what? Not my will but your will be done. He said, I don't want to do it, but I'll do it. That's reluctant obedience. It's biblical. It's also real practical in our lives. So uh, here, here's my picture of reluctant obedience. Ten years ago, I realized, hey, we're going to do five worship services on a weekend for a season while we're building Sweetwater. And I said, I'm, I, I won't survive that. So I, I went to a friend who owns Titan Gym, and I said, would you train me? And after he stopped laughing... Uh, <laughs> He said, yeah, show up at 6.30 tomorrow morning. And I was like, 6.30? I don't want to do this. I got up at, you know, before 6.30, so I could get there at 6.30, dragged myself to gym. Was I enthusiastic? No. Did I want to do this? Absolutely not. Did I need to? Yes. But I went. And I almost passed out the first day I was there. That's a whole other story. I'll mention that in another sermon. But then I went back. I went back, and everybody, everybody told me this wonderful lie. They go, oh, you know what? You'll love it after a little while. <laughs> Ten years later, I do not love it. In fact, every single morning when I get up to go do that three times a week, I'm like, oh, crap, here we go again. I don't want to do this. I don't want to get up. I don't want to go work out. I don't want to do any of that stuff. 
But now, you know, we're not doing five services anymore, so I, I could justify quitting, but here's the thing, now I've got grandkids and I wanna keep up with them. So I like the results of that obedience, but uh, I'm still reluctantly going. There's no joy in getting up and going to work out. None, zero, <laughs> zip. But I like what it does. If you want to experience the power of God, then you have to obey God. And this is the challenge point because Jesus said, if you're gonna follow me, you have to do what? You have to deny yourself. Take up the cross daily and come after me. Deny yourself, which means reluctant obedience. See, and here's the thing, if you practice reluctant obedience, then it becomes routine obedience. And routine obedience means that you're living a life in the power of God. So, uh, well, here's, let's, let's talk about what we can learn from Jonah. Because we're talking about Jonah. So, reluctant obedience resulted in, in amazing repentance. The first thing we see about Jonah was, Jonah was obedient to proclaim. He got to Nineveh. Nineveh was a big city. Like, you know, 120,000 people living there. That's later in chapter 4. Uh, but 120,000 people living there, three days walk across. I don't know why it took so long. Maybe they had a maze or something. But uh, I'm pretty sure I could walk across Phoenix in three days. But, uh, but they, you know, three days. So he walked in for a day. And then he preached probably the least exciting sermon ever. Hey, everyone. God's going to destroy this place in 40 days. Might want to repent. I don't really want you to, but you might want to repent. <laughs> now, I mean, think about it. He didn't want them to repent. He wanted them to be destroyed. Every neighboring nation around the Assyrians wanted them to be destroyed. He's like rooting for God to ignore them. But he did it. He went. He proclaimed. Now, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world, if you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, God has sent you to tell people about Jesus. God has sent you to tell people about Jesus. I mean, that's just it. That's what he's done. That's our job. We know this because the last thing he says to his disciples is recorded by the, uh, the gospel writer Luke, Acts chapter one, verse eight. He says, Jesus said this. By the way, Jesus said this when all of his followers were like, hey, is it gonna be like really cool now and you're gonna like take over everything and we get to rule and reign? Yeah. And Jesus said, no. By the way, you don't need to know when that's gonna happen. It's gonna happen later. But right now, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. That's what he wants us to do. Which means that you and I, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you've made that commitment, then you have the Holy Spirit in you, and then that means that you are appointed by Jesus to go and proclaim to Lake Havasu and Parker, that's your city, to the state of Arizona, to the people you don't like, that's Samaria. You know what that means? That means you're supposed to take the grace of God that can change people's lives, any people's lives, and, and you're supposed to share it with people you don't like. People who vote differently than you. <laughs> See, a lot of times we're like the people, we're like Jonah. We're really like Jonah. First we run from God, then we cry out to God in desperation, and then we want our enemies to burn. It's true. But God has said, I want you to take my love, my grace, and I want you to share it with people you don't like. People who vote differently than you, people who believe differently than you, people who see the world differently than you, I want you to take it to them. And by the way, I want you to go everywhere else as well. The amazing grace of God is connected to that reluctant obedience. So are you involved in the mission of life change? Mission of Calvary is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Are you involved in that mission? And if so, how are you involved? I want you to think about this. How are you involved in that mission? First of all, some of you are involved in that mission of life change by giving to the offering. 
Now, we don't pass the plate here at Calvary. We got offering boxes, if case you're new and you're wondering how we do that. We got offering boxes. We want you to give as you want to give. You can also give online. Most people actually do that nowadays. Uh, but you can give online. All different kinds of ways to give. They're explained in your bulletin. And, and, and so if you give to Calvary, then guess what? 100% of what you give to Calvary goes to the mission of life change. 20% of it goes to missions here and all over the world. The rest of it goes to support staff and ministries and buildings that are used constantly for life change. That's what we do. So, by the way, if you're giving anything to Calvary, you're supporting the mission of life change, thank you. I, it is appreciated. And then some of you are involved in the mission of life change by serving in ministries. You're, you're a greeter with first impressions. You're helping out with the kids in CK during the services. You're helping out with students during the week. You're working with tech we got to love the people with tech because none of this happens without people running the show from behind the scenes. Or maybe you're on the worship team or maybe you're leading a life group. If you're doing any of those things, praise God and thank you for serving. Or maybe, yeah, you guys can celebrate that. I think it's cool. Because guess, guess what? I don't know if you realize this, but none of that happens without volunteers doing all that ministry. And then some of you are involved in the mission of life change through serving our community. Other radical service is one of our core values. We believe the love of Christ is best expressed through acts of kindness and service. And so just this month, we have done two huge mission opportunities in our community. We did serve our schools. A couple hundred people, probably more, were involved in all the different campuses, school campuses in Havasu and Parker, blessing people and making the schools look better. And then just last weekend, we had the Crossroads Car Show out at the racetrack, 365 cars, thousands, of, probably a couple thousand people wandering through, checking out cars, enjoying the day, eating free hot dogs. I heard they, they cooked 1,200 hot dogs, gave them all away. Uh, so, uh, and, and by the way, I didn't eat one because I don't think hot dogs are food. So, uh, <laughs> but look, if you are serving the community, you're helping lead life change Praise God and thank you. And then some of you are really passionate and involved in inviting family and friends to come to church. A lot of you are here because somebody invited you to come. And, and I praise God for that. In fact, uh, all of us can invite family and friends to attend with you. Uh, Pastor Sean already shared about these really nifty Easter cards, at least in this service. Uh, if you're at the Parker campus, you guys have your own Easter invite cards. If you're online, we, I guess we could mail some to you, but uh, you're just gonna have to like, encourage people to come watch the service with you. But uh, hey, why don't you grab some of these on your way out and not just put them on your fridge to remind you what the times are, but actually hand them out to your neighbors? What if all of us just simply invited the three neighbors closest to us, even the ones you don't like? I did mention that, right? And invite them to come to church. Invite them to come with you. Invite them to come be a part. It's amazing what can happen because if we want to see amazing repentance, like Lake Havasu and Parker coming to faith in Christ, then we need to be obedient to invite. And if you don't want to be obedient, that's fine. Do it anyway. That's what reluctant obedience looks like, doesn't it? You're like, well, I don't want to do it. Well, then repent. If you were honest about wanting to see the power of God in your life, because when Jonah proclaimed, the people believed God. This, this was amazing. He was not expecting this. He was afraid it would happen, but he was not expecting it. Verse 5, and the people of Nineveh believed God. Now, understand, in the Old Testament times, every nation had their own gods. And so, you know, Jonah was talking about the God of Israel. The one true God, the way we understand it now. But they saw that as, a, as an Israeli God, not as a Ninevite God, not as an Assyrian God. They had their own gods. We don't need your puny God. He can't even stop us from conquering your people. But they believed God. I mean, they, they, right there. I mean, they heard him and they went, oh, okay, we believe God. Now, most of you are here or joining us online because you believe in Jesus. Some of you are here or tuning in because you're trying to decide if you're gonna follow Jesus. But the danger is kinda 
casual belief or intellectual agreement with the concept of Jesus. Yes, I believe. I, people say that to me all the time when I invite them to church, when I talk to them about God. They're like, oh, you know, I believe in God. Do you guys get that from your friends too? Get that from your neighbors? Maybe sometimes yourself is, you're that way. You're like, oh yeah, I believe in God. Well, big deal. I mean, that's what the Bible says, big deal. If it doesn't result in any life change, so what? Do you, do you know that you can technically believe in Jesus and not follow Jesus? At least that's what scripture teaches. James chapter two, the apostle James, Jesus' half-brother said, even the demons believe in God and they cower before him. In other words, the demons understand the power of God. They understand the reality of God and, and when they are in his presence, they cower before him. You read the gospels, every time Jesus was casting demons out, they were like, you know, trying to tell everybody who he was. The demons believe in God. So next time you say, hey, why don't you come to church with me? Oh, I don't need to go to church. I believe in God. Go, so what? So do the demons. They're not going to heaven. Just thought you might want to know. I don't want to go hang out with the demons because I believe like them. You go, Pastor, do you really need to mention that? I mean, because we're in church and everything. Well, you know, I grew up and have served in churches where everyone believed the right stuff. I mean, everybody agreed the Bible was God's word. They just didn't read or apply it very much. Everyone agreed intellectually that God could change lives. They believed that God could change anybody's lives. They preached grace wonderfully. They just didn't actually believe that God would change anybody in this service. Not like this service, but whatever service they were having. You know how I knew that? Because nobody invited their friends. Nobody ever invited anyone to come with them. Hey, why don't you invite your friends to church? Oh, yeah, I should do that. I never did. See, here's the thing. If you don't believe that God's actually capable of changing lives, you're not gonna bring anybody to experience life change. It's that simple. If you really honestly believe that your, that, that your friend's life will be changed by an encounter with Jesus Christ, you will do whatever it takes to harass, beg, plead, bribe, uh, do, to get them in the door and to be here. Because you know that if they're there, there's a chance that God's gonna you know, interrupt their lives and they're gonna go, wow, that was real and God is real and he can change my life. Now, they may come and go, eh, not for me, and walk out the door, but at least you got them here because you believe God can change them. And you go, well, not this time. We'll get them next time, right, God? It happens. But they didn't, they didn't you know, invite anyone. Now, they preached loving people, but lots of people were mean Judgmental? Yeah, you got it. Specialize in calling out other people's sins because Jesus tells us to do that all the time, right? They preached tithing, but most people ignored it. They preached forgiveness, but a lot of people still held grudges. You could tell by the nasty business meetings that we had. But not in Nineveh. Not in Nineveh. They believed God. See, Jonah was reluctantly obedient, and the people believed God, and then the people changed their behavior. They changed their behavior. Look, it is so drastic. It is amazing. So the people of Nineveh, verse 5, the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast, put on sackcloth. Think burlap sacks. Ugh. From the greatest of them to the least of them, the word reached the king of Nineveh. And he got up from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, sat in dirt, in ashes. He issued a proclamation, published throughout Nineveh, by the decree of the king and the nobles, let no one eat, it doesn't matter, beast, herd, flock, taste anything, let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, let everyone call out mightily to God, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Wow. We're talking about changed behavior radically. Fasting, sackcloth, turn from evil, stop being violent. And of course, God saw their repentance. And he decided not to destroy Nineveh, disappointing Jonah and the neighboring nations. So here's the thing. We say we believe God. So easy to do, isn't it? 
We confess Jesus as Lord. We declare our love for Jesus in our worship, and some of you worship passionately. We declare our love for Jesus in our bumper stickers and the clothing we wear, of course, on our social media posts. But have we changed our behavior? Have we repented? Now, some of us kind of protest, like, yeah, but we're waiting for the Holy Spirit to show up in just a powerful way and, and, you know, just overwhelm us with a holy experience so that we really want to repent. And God can do that. And he has done that occasionally in history. But not usually for lazy, disobedient children. Yeah, I said that out loud, didn't I? I actually wrote it in my notes, too. See, I've been surprised and, uh, by God's overwhelming presence, captured by his power at times, been brought to tears where I couldn't even sing. Uh, but each of those moments involved an element of seeking him, even if it just meant an effort to show up. Look, if we desire God to do an amazing work of grace and power in our lives and in our families and in our church and in our communities, what are we willing to change? What are you willing to change? By the way, this is a theme throughout Scripture. In the Old Testament, Joshua chapter 1 Uh, God is talking to Joshua and his people that he's getting ready to lead into the promised land. And he says, only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. And do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. Sounds like a good deal, doesn't it? Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Yes, if we do all according to God's word. How about 2 Chronicles 7, 14? I grew up hearing this verse quoted all the time in church. Oh, we need to have revival. We need to have revival. Listen to this. God, again, talking to his people as they dedicate the temple, says, if my people, that's us, if you're a follower of Jesus, who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn, that's repent, from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Or how about Jesus? He's my favorite anyway. Luke chapter six, Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Could just stop there, but he doesn't. Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock, and when a flood arose and the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built, But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who has built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. How about Matthew 7, when Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. All right, just John 14, 15, Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If we love Jesus, it isn't demonstrated by our declarations, our enthusiasm, our worship intensity, our bumper stickers, or our social media declarations. It is only evident by our repentance and our obedience. By the way, the apostles echoed this sentiment in the New Testament as well. The apostle Paul contrasted the deeds of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit in Galatians chapter five. Great passage to read and meditate on. He talked about our changed behaviors in Ephesians 5 when he said, once you were children of darkness, but now you were children of light. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, the the verse that's on our baptism shirt says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things pass away, all things become new. If you're in Christ. Again, one of my favorites, James 1, 22, again, half-brother of Jesus. 
He just simply says, be doers of the word and not hearers only, and so deceive yourselves. I don't want us to be deceived. I want us to hear God's word. I want us to do God's word. I want us to build our lives on the rock. I want us to to follow Jesus because we exist to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. And that means salvation, that people experience that, that forgiveness of sin. They declare their allegiance to Jesus in baptism. But it doesn't stop there because we want you to experience blessings and healing and hope and the, the power of God. I want you to live in joyful freedom following Jesus. And that is found in repentance and obedience. Reluctant obedience to Jesus. And, and some of you know at this moment what God is telling you to specifically change. Some of you right now are, are dealing with conviction by the Holy Spirit because if you're a follower of Jesus, then God the Holy Spirit lives in you and he is the one who convicts of sin. He's the one who teaches truth. So if right now you're going, like, the Holy Spirit's going, hey, hey, stop listening to him, listen to me, just do that. Because you know what he wants you to change. He, you know what he's challenging you to do with your life. And so if you know what the Holy Spirit's telling you to do, do it. If you're not sure, then maybe you just simply need to apply what you know in areas of things like kindness. Because love is patient and love is kind. So if you're not being kind, you're not doing the will of God. Plain and simple, period. Be kind. Uh, Some of you need to learn how to forgive. Some of you need to learn how to serve. I did mention the lazy, disobedient children earlier, didn't I? Yeah. Some of us need to, like, you know, practice that whole invitation thing. Uh, Did I mention we have these cards to invite people to church for Easter? So, um, no, I mean, we know it's God's will for you to, like, influence people for life change, so why don't you take at least three of these when you leave, and why don't you harass, I mean, invite three (laughs) of your friends, your family members who do not go to church. Okay, if they go to church someplace else, leave them alone. Okay? Target the 40,000 unchurched people in Lake Havasu City, the 5,000 unchurched people in Parker. And let's see what God will do. Right? We ought to be able to at least invite, you know, a third of them to come to church in the next couple of weeks. Um, Some of you need to get baptized. I mean, you confess Jesus, but you've never actually declared that confession in the waters of baptism, and we would love to baptize you. We're gonna be baptizing on Easter. I'd love to have people baptize every service so that the people who come here once a year will see somebody get baptized and think, maybe God needs to do that in my life too. But you know what? We'll baptize you any time, any day. There's water and a crowd. So let us know when and where, and we'll help you be obedient to Jesus. (coughs) Some of you... Need to read your Bible instead of talk about it? Really? Because to do the law, you have to actually know what it says. Some of you just need to get serious about repenting. Some of you need to repent of unfaithfulness to your spouse, whether that's actual adultery or porn addiction or emotional attachments. Some of you need to repent of your addiction, whether that's to drugs or alcohol or gambling or eating. Some of you, God's calling to tithe. You know, you're, you're faithful to God in pursuing obedience in everything but your money, and that's the one thing that God's like, oh, now, hey, are you gonna trust me with that? Some of you, I think God's calling to surrender to full-time ministry or missions. And God wants you to serve someplace or in some way uh, with your whole life. So it comes down to, will you do what God says to do? Will you believe God Repent and change your behavior. Because remember, reluctant obedience becomes routine obedience, and that leads us to living in the power of God. Now, if your answer is yes, I'm gonna do what God wants me to do, then you know we're, our prayer team's gonna be here after the service. You may wanna come and pray and ask them to pray for you. Or be really bold and courageous and make an appointment to talk to one of the pastors. It doesn't have to be me. You know, but we all have appointments in our schedules each week. Make an appointment and sit down and say, hey, I think God's telling me to do this. Let us have, you know, bring some accountability into it. You know, a little of that confession stuff, it's good. 
Or maybe you just need to show up at Celebrate Recovery 6.30 Monday night in this room. Okay? In other words, what are you going to do to evidence the repentance in your life? Will you do what God says to do? And if your answer really is, no, I'm not going to, then please hear Jesus when he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? You see, I want us to experience the amazing grace, the power of God, and the way we get there is to obey, whether we feel like it or not. Will you pray with me? Father, we love you. You know our hearts. You know we love you, but you also know how we fail you, and yet your grace just washes over us again and again and again. You keep forgiving us and calling us to a life of obedience that leads to a life of blessings and power and hope. So, Father, meet us here and change us. That is our prayer. We ask it in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen.